What's up and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Tuesday, February 28th. Frank Stample joined by Scott White. We've got a jam-packed show for you today. Position previews recap. We'll run through each of the positions. A quick thought on strategy, plus our favorite target at said position. Latest news and, unfortunately, injuries out of spring training. And we've got deep sleepers later on in the podcast with a special guest. Excited to do that as well. Scotty. Happy TGFBI day to you for people who might be wondering what that is. If you follow us on Twitter or follow anybody in the fantasy baseball industry on Twitter, you might've noticed a bunch of draft boards going up, people talking about this thing called TGFBI. Well, it's a collection of 15 team five by five Roto leagues. I think there's 29 of them. They compete uh, not only within their league, but against each other. There's an overall prize and it's run by Justin Mason from the sleeper and the bus podcast. He does fantastic work. Happy to do it. But Scott, this is kind of like the kickoff, for me at least, of real drafts that were playing out with waivers and everyone's into it. And I'm excited mm-hmm. to talk about it. How's, how's your draft going so far? Yeah, it's not my first of those uh, because I, we did those AL and NL only Roto leagues that you're not a part of, Frank, last week. But this is a big week in general. You got this. We got a couple more. Um, Couple more salary cap drafts coming up this week. I got score sheet drafts starting. Like, yeah, it's it's really picking up. Uh, so I I I'm really happy with the way my team started out in my TGFBI league. I was able to accomplish my goal of going outfield round one, third base in round two, second base in round three, mm. which I was picking eighth. So I wasn't confident one of the deserving third basemen was going to make it back to me. In the, in the very middle of round two there, eight, eight, eight of 15, it's a 15 team league. Fortunately, Austin Riley, because somebody took Marcus Simeon before Riley was uh, off the board, I was able to get Riley with my second pick, took Juan Soto in round one, Riley in round two, and then got Jose Altuve, who I, I haven't been able to get in round three in most of the 12 teamers we do, but I got him in this one. Nice. And then in round four, uh, I decided to keep attacking hitting to build a nice foundation of home runs, RBI run scored uh, took Kyle Schwarber and, uh, you know, got a second outfielder, which is going to be important in a five outfielder league. So no pitchers yet through four rounds. I'm not sure I'm going to take a pitcher next round either. We'll see who's still out there. Uh, I, I, I just, there's so many mid tier pitchers. I like that. I feel like if I have most of my hitter spots filled out, certainly the big ones, uh, then I can hit that pretty hard in the middle rounds while others are others are kind of digging through the hitter scraps. Yeah, so I was picking at pick 11 in the first round, and I really wanted an outfielder, Scott. I wanted one of Betts or Soto. Both of those guys were gone at my pick, and then I knew once the Jordan Alvarez injury is now taking place and we're dealing with that, uh, left hand soreness for Jordan Alvarez, something he dealt with last year. Yeah. I knew he was going to make it to me and I would have to make a decision. Now I, I do have another draft and hold league where I already have Alvarez and I start thinking, I'm like, I don't want to be overexposed. I'm kind of worried about this hand thing. I know it's late February. It could turn out to be absolutely nothing, but Shohei Otani was still on the board for me. And I'm like, all right, there's <laughs> another player who has as much or even more upside than Alvarez. And mm-hmm. I'll just go that route. And I took Otani don't typically like how my teams turn out with the util only. Yeah, that's what I was saying. We, we mocked once where you took him yeah. in round one and you were not happy with the way that went. And I, I don't yeah. blame you. I mean, if you're thinking position scarcity, DH is obviously not not going to help with that. But uh, the, the Alvarez thing, it's funny you bring it up because I have him ranked ahead of Juan Soto, but I got scared away with the eighth pick. Yeah, uh, that was part of it. OK, I'll take Soto instead. I was the kind of the dream scenario is like, what if people so overreacted to the Jordan Alvarez hand situation that he made it to me in round two, <laughs> that would have been that would have been crazy, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah. Alvarez went 13th pick in my draft. After I took Otani, I also got Austin Riley in round two. I was one pick away from getting Machado. If I would have got Otani and Machado to start my draft, We've absolutely loved it. Riley is yeah. a perfect consolation prize. We both got that. Riley. We can root for him together. Yeah. And then in the third round, I got Randy or Rosarena. So getting that first outfielder, I did uh, consider Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer. I was uh, 
you know, I was heavily considering that, but ultimately I went with the outfielder uh, and then I took Zach Wheeler in round four. So we'll see what happens here in round five, but man, there are pitchers are now flying off the board. Like Darvish just went in round five. I was hoping to get either him or Musgrove uh, it, later on in this round. So we'll see if they make it to me. Scott, let's get into our position previews recap. Obviously we, you know, did all these position previews the past couple of weeks, but now we just kind of want to quickly run through each of them, talk a little bit of strategy and our favorite targets. And we'll start things off with catcher feels better than usual. Scott up top. I know famous last words, normally catcher some, I guess it could look good and then it doesn't turn out that way, but I actually feel pretty strong about it. 10 names uh, that I, I do like quite a bit. What's your strategy in uh, for a catcher this season? And does it change in one catcher versus two catcher leagues? So my strategy at catcher is not to overpay. Uh, last year, of course, I was really into Salvador Perez drafting him in round three or four. And uh, because he, he looked like such a distant number one at the position. And it didn't really pan out. He had some health issues. Uh, but the whole position has been transformed since then such that there there isn't like a runaway number one and a bunch of crud after that you know it's it's as deep as i can remember catcher being i see uh at least nine choices that i feel really good about uh, which takes us through william Contreras and sean murphy those are my top two tiers at the catcher position it's nine names deep uh and it's yeah, JT Real Muto is the best of them, and he and Dalton Varsho are the only two who are going to give you any amount of stolen bases. But leaving stolen bases out of it, uh, I feel really good about all nine. And so if I can get one of those nine, it's usually going to be William Contreras or Sean Murphy, then I'm pretty happy with that. And I think it's more important to do that in a one-catcher league because you're generally talking in one catcher leagues, no middle infield spot, no corner infield spot, just three outfielders, small lineups overall, few fewer ways to differentiate yourself. In a two catcher league where you have all those other extra hitter spots to fill, uh, you're not going to be strong everywhere. And so I'm still okay taking like if if I just don't if I don't get a great value for one of those nine catchers I like, then I'm kind of okay just punting at the position as has long been a strategy because even the good catchers you know they're, they're not giving you 90 and 90 runs in rbi you know real muto might give you 80 and 80 but most of them you're talking like 65 to 70 runs in rbi yeah. uh salvador perez could have a ton of rbi i guess but mm -hmm. overall the combined number of runs in rbi for catchers even the really good ones is less than you're going to get from a good player at another position that's absolutely true scott i think the one thing and obviously you know this, but people need to realize is when drafting catchers, it's all relative to the position. So yes, even the good catchers are only going to give you 60, 65 runs and RBI each of those categories. But I mean, the bad ones might be giving you like 30 or 40. So obviously relative to the position, uh, those, those mid round targets are, are still pretty good. Who is your favorite target at the position, Scott? For me, it's become Sean Murphy. I mean, the Braves acquired him in the offseason. He did some really good things last year, made more contact, and now he's going to a much better ballpark, much better lineup. His career numbers on the road have been really, really good. So I think he kind of takes off here, and we see a Will Smith light type season from Sean Murphy. Yeah. So he's the one yeah, I cut down. Cut down on the strikeouts the final two thirds of the year, had a low strikeout rate in the minors, too. So I think it was. The start of a breakout for Sean Murphy. I have him as a breakout pick this year. He is the last of the nine for me, so he's somebody I draft a fair amount as well. If William Contreras lasts longer, then I'm likely to draft him. Uh, it's it's rare that I draft any of my top seven. It's usually one of those two if I spend it catcher. All right, let's move over to first base where we got the four studs up top at the position, which includes Vlad, Freddie Freeman, Pete Alonzo, and Paul Goldschmidt. You can make it five if you want to include Matt Olson. But this is a really, really deep position, Scott. Arguably the deepest in all of fantasy baseball. How have you been attacking first base thus far? I am waiting at first base. It is one of two positions in, in a, at, a, at a time when position scarcity is, is back with uh, the end of the juice ball era, uh, home runs not being 
as prevalent, as widespread, and not as available to uh, some of the players who were, you know, more agile, more mobile, more in there for uh, defensive considerations. It's it's back to being a, a situation where home runs are um, are most available to kind of the hulking plotters, which tend to be first basemen. So this is one of two positions where you can afford to wait, where it's not scarce. And so as much as I like Vladimir Guerrero, Freddie Freeman, um, it's, it's a, it's a wasted opportunity at another position if you draft them at their going rate. So I tend to live in the mid round range, uh, guys like Reese Hoskins, Christian Walker, Rowdy Telez, even, uh, and, that, and that's that tends to be how I fill my first base spot. If I can get good value on like a Matt Olson or a Vinny Pasquantino or or maybe even a Jose Abreu, I think Jose Abreu's cost has been going up, has been going up, but it started out surprisingly low. Then great, that's even better. But the the point is, I don't want to invest a lot in a first baseman because I don't think. I have to. I mean, just look at, just compare Christian Walker's numbers last year to Matt Olson. They're virtually identical. And yet Olson's going much sooner. Understandably, better track record, more confidence level. I get it, but uh, you can't, you can't afford to have. You know, you you have to, you have to be willing to take a chance somewhere, and I'd rather take it on take that chance at this position where you do have that handful of players who are at least studly last year, if maybe for the first time. Mm-hmm. I'd love to get Jose Abreu in my draft, Scott. I mean, I feel like we've talked him up quite a bit since joining the Houston Astros this offseason, but typically I do wind up waiting. There's a lot of really good shortstops that go around where Jose Abreu goes. Uh, and if I wait, it's usually one of Anthony Rizzo or Rowdy Telez. Telez I have as a an undervalued player this season, hit 35 home runs last year, one of 10 players to do that, and consciously change his approach, hitting more fly balls. The barrel rate was up as well. Uh, I, I have a lot of faith in Rowdy Telez again this upcoming season. Let's move over to second base, Scott. No players going in the first two rounds of this position, only four going in the first 40 picks, and that would include Jose Altuve, uh, Marcus Semien, Ozzy Albies, and uh, Jazz Chisholm, who are going inside of the top 50 picks. All right, lay it on us, Scotty. Second base. Yeah, strategy. so this is, cl- this is clearly the weakest position at the top. I like to grab one of those top three, Jose Altuve, Marcus Simeon, Ozzy Albies, usually requires a round three pick to do it. Uh, so as I mentioned at the top of the show, the way I'm looking to start basically every draft this year is outfield round one, third base round two, second base round three. That's that's where the uh, the the stand, that's that's like the range where you have to dra- draft a that where you're most likely to find a standout where you're most likely to get a standout at those three weakest positions. So round three at second base, if I can get out to a Simeon or even all these, then I'll do it. Otherwise I'm probably going to rate wait. If, if jazz Chisholm makes it to round five, then I'll think about him there, but he seems pretty risky by comparison with his injury history, uh, high reward, but high risk as well. So I'm not going to do it in round four in all likelihood. And the thing about second base, I you know, I I because it's so lacking at the top, when we first started recording the position previews, I think I was calling it the weakest position. But it does have a high number of like decent bats. Nobody who's gonna uh remind you of a stud. Um, but like it's 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 pretty deep in the middle, especially if you're talking a deeper league like a 15 teamer. There are, there are a lot of useful options at second base, and there are some bounce back candidates in Jorge Polanco, Cattell Marte, Brandon Lau. So I'd rather not wait at second base. It's it's not like first base where I'm looking to wait there, but you can get away with waiting there a little easier than you can uh, third base, for instance. Who is, and you might've said this guy, and maybe I just missed it. Who is your favorite to target? I know typically you want one of those third round guys, but is it Jose Altuve for you? Yeah. Yeah. And and some people rank Simeon ahead. I rank Altuve ahead. So there's a decent chance I'll get him a fair amount. 
this TGFBI league. I, I think it's the first time I actually have succeeded in getting Altuve, but hopefully, hopefully that'll happen more often moving forward. Yeah, I love getting Jose Altuve as well. If I can pull it off in the third round of drafts, he was a legit, really good hitter last year. I mean, not just for yeah. fantasy purposes, 921 OPS, 164 weighted runs created plus. Those were both fourth best among qualified hitters for Jose Altuve last season. So, And if you're, and, and if you're talking points leagues, yeah, uh, players with at least 300 at-bats, the gap between Jose Altuve and the second second baseman in points per game was bigger than in any other position except for outfield, where obviously Aaron Judge was a runaway. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's Altuve more valuable than he gets credit for. I have noticed, though, Scott, like you mentioned, in deeper leagues, if I do manage to miss out on those top tier second basemen, I don't really mind waiting. If I can yeah. get a Jorge Polanco on the bounce back two years ago, he was a top 40 player overall in Roto Leagues, and his plate discipline should you know still favor him in head-to-head points as well. Or even Jonathan India. I know last year he was dreadful. He injured his hamstring earlier on early in the season. I don't think he was ever truly healthy the year before that. 20 homers, 10 steals, National League Rookie of the Year. I'm expecting another bounce back season here for Jonathan India. Third base strategy. All right, Scott. So from uh, second base to third base, I guess uh, strategy wise, we don't really, it doesn't really yeah. change very much, but we have multiple cliff dives in terms of talent and average draft position among third base. Six I, I mean, I think, I think it's really just one cliff dive. Well, let, well let's talk about it. Six players okay. going in the first 32 picks, and then it drops down to Alex Bregman and Gunnar Henderson. And then after that, it drops 40 more picks, and you get to Max Muncy who also has second base eligibility. So he could be drafted by another team for either second or third base. And then you start mm-hmm. to get into Suarez and Matt Chapman and those guys. So I think yeah. you got the first group Scott up top and mm-hmm. then it drops down, you get Bregman and Gunner, and then it drops down again after that. And it's okay. look, if you don't have one by Bregman and Gunner Henderson. You, you probably don't feel too great about it. Yeah. So the way I break it down and I, I feel like third base is the most important position this year. And the way I, Think of it as get in early or don't get in at all because you do have those six chances to get in with one of your first two picks. Uh, and the reason I target, a, you know, the reason I aim to, to grab a third baseman in round two is five of them tend to go in round two. So you have Jose Ramirez, a clear first rounder, one of the top two or three picks in every draft, most likely. And, uh, and then in round two, you have some, in some order, Rafael Devers, Manny Machado, Austin Riley, Bobby Witt, uh, and then the, the last one who I haven't mentioned is Nolan Arenado, who will occasionally slide to round three. But it's so important to me that I fill third base, like that I don't miss out in this range of third basemen. That, like, if I'm picking late in round two, and presuming those other four are gone already, like I'm, I'm going to take Arenado. I'm not going to take the chance of 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 him making it to my third pick. So that's my approach there. And if it doesn't work out then I really want to draft one of Alex Bregman, Gunnar Henderson, or Max Muncy. I think Max Muncy's being undervalued. I think he was basically back to form over the final two months last year, and we can trust him again. Plus, he's dual eligible at second base, which helps. So I'd really like to get one of those three if I if I whiff and don't get a, a third baseman in round one and two. It's just there are only three of them. And so it's going to be really hard to resist reaching to make sure that you secure one of them and it's not a game i want to play so i'm just taking one in round two if i can help it and then not having to worry about it anymore and and by the way after those three i mean yeah eugenio suarez matt chapman they could provide some power not much else and then there's really not a lot. There's there's not like a lot of promising options at the position. Uh, Jordan Walker, if he's able to make the Cardinals roster, uh, you know, we, we figure he'll be up at some point sooner than later. And he retains third base eligibility. He's going to be an outfielder in the majors. So he's kind of the ace in the hole, I guess. But as with any player that young and inexperienced, you don't really know what he's going to do. And, um, you know, he might not be available to you from the start. So. It's not, it's not the best plan to count on him. 
but he is the one who like the the ultimate fallback option at this position. Mm -hmm. I, I agree wholeheartedly, Scott. Machado, Devers, Riley. Uh, Machado is the favorite uh, for me of that group. So if I can get him late first or early second round, uh, I would like to pull that off if I can. But as you mentioned, if not, then uh, I wouldn't. You know, I like Alex Bregman. I don't love him. I, I think he's fine where he goes. But if I miss out on that, I'm probably just waiting. And Jordan Walker, <laughs> he had a double dong over the weekend. No, not a double dong. He had one homer, but just it was one, a yeah. massive home run. It was 430 foot off of uh, Johnny Cueto. So I have a feeling people are going to overreact to this. And we'll see Jordan Walker climb up a little bit. But if I can get a young player like him or Josh Young, pair him with like an old, boring veteran, Justin Turner type guy, I'm probably just waiting and, and doing something like that if I yeah. miss out on the top three at the position. Let's take a quick break. And when we return, we'll get to shortstop. We've got outfield. we got starting pitcher and relief pitcher as well. And we'll do that here on Fantasy Baseball Today. March Madness is almost here. Who's in? Who's out? The answers are revealed on the March Madness Selection Show, March 12th on CBS. Let's get back into our position previews recap and I realized I was supposed to talk about Shohei Otani on this podcast today because we didn't talk about him on any of the position previews, but we'll do that tomorrow. We've got Ariel Cohen coming on to talk about his ATC projections. So uh, we'll put him and Scott in a steel cage and they'll wrestle each other and they'll argue about projections and, and then uh, we'll see who the winner is. And we'll also talk about Shohei Otani and a couple other players as well. We'll do that tomorrow. Let's get into shortstop strategy. Scott, along with first base, it's one of the yep. deepest positions in fantasy baseball. And it's tough because, at least for me, I have this internal struggle whether to fill the position early or not. I've talked time and time again how much I love Corey Seager, and now his price seemingly looks like it's on the rise. I've been seeing him go inside the top 50 picks in a lot of drafts that I've been doing. I'd love to get him, but then, you know, for the next two, three, four rounds after that, the best player in your queue might be a shortstop. So you've got to decide, do I want to fill this position early, or do I just yeah. wait and... and you know, take the best value that falls to me. Yeah, I would say the deeper the league, uh, the the less you can afford to wait. And it pains me to say that because like first base, this is the rare position where you can afford to wait. But unlike first base, that only applies up to a point because uh, while shortstop is, let me see if I could count them up real quick. Uh, what about 14 deep in must start players, which, you know, if you're, if you're talking a 12 team league where everybody has one shortstop spot and no middle infield spot to fill, there's more than enough to go around. And you could probably get Willie Adamas in round 12, 13, something like that. It'd be fine. But if you're talking a 15 team Roto league where everybody has a middle infield spot to fill and, and, uh, and yeah, there's, you know, 15 teams have a shortstop spot to fill too. Then once you get past that group, the drop-off is swift and steep and scary. There are a few interesting names beyond it. I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say it's, you know, completely barren. But after, you know, once you get up past the top 20 at shortstop, let's say, there's nothing. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not true of first base. I mean, first base is pretty much deep at, at every stage of the draft. So that's how I would distinguish those two positions. But compared to third base, compared to second base, I guess. I mean, there there is a point where it flipped. Like shortstop is deeper early on and second base is weaker early on. But there's a point in the draft where it flips and second base becomes much deeper than shortstop. So that's... It just kind of depends uh, what sort of league you're playing and how you view those two positions. I think that drop-off is around where Carlos Correa goes, Scott, as that 14 shortstop, right around pick 104, 105 in drafts right now. Some people might include Jeremy Pena in that conversation, maybe in a categories league. Heads, head points. His plate discipline drags him down a little bit. But yeah, once you get past that group, maybe there's a bounce back on Javier Baez. But yeah. yeah. Uh, Ezekiel really Tovar is a breakout candidate as Walt Peraza. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't even that group, even those kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of straining, squinting to see 
them putting together competitive production at the position. And, and even that group doesn't last very long. Who is your favorite to target at shortstop? I like you probably Corey Seager, either him or O'Neill Cruz, because you don't have to invest. You generally don't have to invest a, a top four round pick in them. There's usually one of them available. We're talking 12 team league. There's usually at least one available in round five. And that's probably the most I could justify paying at shortstop this year. Mm -hmm. It's all about Corey Seager, man. Let's make it happen. The, the shift is gone. Hits a lot of line drives, pulls the ball, obviously had the power last year. Let's get that batting average back up as his expected batting average was up over 280. So really looking forward to a bounce back in terms of uh, the batting average for Corey Seager this year. Let's talk about outfield, Scott, a position that is filled with injury risk and unproven talent. We have really good players that go in the first round, obviously, yep. but the decline is, is pretty swift at the outfield position as well. So what is your strategy and does it change in a three outfielder league versus a five outfielder league? Yeah. To answer the second question, not a lot. I mean, it's, it's weak either way, even in three outfielder leagues. Uh, outfield is outfield's probably the weakest position. I said third base is the most important position just because of the way it breaks down where you, you pretty much have to get in early outfield overall, though, I would say is the weakest position. So if you have to go five deep at it, whew, it, it gets ugly. And you know, there, there aren't going to be too many teams in that league who feel good about their fourth and fifth outfielder. Uh, seven of the first round picks will most likely be outfielders. So that's why it's so important, I think, to, to make sure you get one of those seven. Uh, there aren't, uh, other than Mike Trout, there isn't a clear-cut second round outfielder. So you don't have, uh, you know, if, if you if you take something other than an outfielder in round one, you don't have a chance to correct the mistake in round two, other than the drop. And uh, and then by about, you know, by by the time you get to around twenty five or thirty in the outfield rankings, it, kind of like at third base, it's you you run out of options. You run out of options you can feel comfortable with or get or even get excited about. Um, of course it, there just being so many names because three times as many players play the outfield as anything else. I don't mean that literally there are a few scattered players that I like, but it certainly doesn't feel like a, a lot of safe bets. Uh, so it's, it's another position that I try to fill early and, and, you know, I, I have to say that about so many positions. That's why I really appreciate the opportunity to wait at first base and shortstop because, yeah. uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to go heavy early at those positions. But historically, I've never been a big fan of drafting outfield early. But it's it's just in a weird spot right now. And uh, I try to get at least two outfielders by, by the time we reach the... Uh, the end of the top 25 30 at the position if i can get three even better i mentioned it scott but look at the injury risk that comes with this position george springer eloy jimenez and some of these names are ones that we really like too stalling Marte, byron buxton tyler o'neill christian yelich has had injuries in the past though he did stay healthy last year Giancarlo stanton say suzuki is already dealing with an oblique injury uh, chris bryant has missed a lot of time so yep there's Into talent here Asiatis. there's talent but there's also a lot of risk with those players as well. Do you have one or two names, Scott, that you typically target most at outfield? Obviously, the the one I take in round one depends where I'm picking. Uh, I like grabbing Kyle Schwarber a lot in round four. You know, I've kind of laid out, I've kind of mapped out my plan for rounds one, two, and three. Four, if Kyle Schwarber's there, there's a good chance I'll look toward him uh, because he is... You know, his 46 home runs last year were the second most in the majors. He's a monster power hitter. And I, I feel like those guys are uh, being undervalued in fantasy right now coming out of the juice ball era. Home runs aren't as plentiful, aren't as easy to find as they used to be. And people haven't really quite caught up to that yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, getting getting Schwarber early like that, especially after investing my first three picks in hitters, gives me 
a nice leg up at what I think is going to be an important category to fill early. Plus, it's a weak position. Yeah, I know we had the debate a couple of weeks ago, Eloy Jimenez and Corbin Carroll. I don't know if no, you weren't on that podcast. That was the uh, position, the ADP battles that we did with with Towers and Welsh. But I like both of those guys a lot. I mean, it's it might depend on what your team needs are at that point in the draft. But you know, fifth, sixth round, Corbin Carroll. Well, you know, first time on base this spring, steals a base. Not that you know we're reading too much into that, but the guy is super fast. Uh, obviously, one of the top prospects in baseball. And then Eloy Jimenez. One of these years, he's going to stay healthy. I, I know I've said that every year, but one of these years, he'll do it. And he's going to be really awesome when he does it. Starting pitcher strategy, Scott, this is basically, I mean, for you at least, what affords you to take hitters early on in the draft. Yeah. Because pitching was much better last season in 2022. Now we have shift restrictions. We have other new rules that will promote offense. But all the times we've talked about this, Scott, it doesn't really seem to affect how you will approach starting pitcher this season. And how is that? Yeah, I don't think the rule changes are going to swing the pendulum back toward hitting so much. It's most of the rule changes are to improve station to station baseball, which just by the nature of it isn't going to lead to a lot of run production like the way home runs did during the juice ball era. So I think dejuicing the ball and uh, making home runs harder to hit again, making making it so not every fly ball is in danger of leaving the yard, which is how it seemed for like a five-year stretch there. I think that did more to help the pitching position than any new rule changes this year are going to hurt the position. And it kind of returned us to the familiar place in fantasy baseball where um, you want to go heavy on hitting early and not worry so much about pitchers and pitching until the middle rounds. And again, it's such an abrupt change that I don't feel like everybody's caught up to it yet. I suppose it's always possible the ball could change again, and uh, I'll and and they'll have been right to slow roll it. But no, I think this was intentional by MB uh, by MLB. I think it's here to stay. And when I was talking about how you know there are all these different positions that I think are important to important to target early, what are you passing over? Well, I mentioned first base and shortstop as positions you can pat potentially pass over. But the more I draft, the more I feel like starting pitcher is the one that you can afford to wait at. There's such a deep middle class there after years of no middle class at all that um, I like to just load up on a bunch of those guys. And uh, I don't think you're going to suffer an ERA and whip as much as we've seen in the past since home runs aren't such a threat to this class of pitcher anymore strikeouts could be an issue but if you're um countering quality with quantity then you can help close that gap in strikeouts are there one or two names scott that you find yourself winding up with most at starting pitcher uh i mean i i don't really have i don't really target that many with great intention seems like I draft Max Freed a lot because he's at the end of a tier for me. And uh, I know he's going to give me a lot of wins, which I think if you're going to invest in a high-end pitcher, you need to get either a lot of strikeouts or a lot of wins, if not both. Mm -hmm. And obviously, projecting wins is incredibly tough, but you just it sounds so simple. You draft pitchers on the best teams and the ones that go deep into their starts. Max Freed is one of those. I love the value of Max Scherzer this year if he lasts to the end of the third, early fourth round. I think he's as likely as anybody to finish as the SP1 or at least a top five pitcher as long as he's healthy. Zach Wheeler, I think he's a tick below that in terms of upside, but I still do like the value on him quite a bit. And Lance Lynn is somebody I keep winding up with, and we spoke about him on our starting pitcher preview part two, I believe it was. And I think he gives you volume, and I think the skills were really good down the stretch last year, and I wind up with Lance Lynn quite a bit as my SP3. Scott, I'm going to skip out on relief pitcher because we just spoke about it yesterday, and I think... Uh, a lot of the things that we just said are, you know, still fresh in people's minds. So you can go back and listen to that. I want to get to some news and obviously leave enough time to get to deep sleepers with our guests a little bit later on. But first, just one thing to promote the CBS Sports Fantasy Baseball Commissioner product 
is here and it lets you run your league your way with endless ways to customize your scoring rosters schedule and more with cbs sports commissioner you can cut out the loopholes and arguments and play exactly how your league wants to my longest running keeper league which is a 12 team head to head points league and the scott white dynasty league are both played on cbs and they both run seamlessly true story someone forgot to check off their uh minor league keepers in the scott white dynasty league and Scott easily reversed it just like that earlier today. Yep. So there you go. Snap you of the it. fingers. <laughs> uh, you can set up custom rules, roto, head-to-head -head points, categories, a salary cap or snake draft, keepers, contracts, draft pick trading, and multiple matchups per period. Uh, also get the latest analysis and advice from Scott, Chris Towers, and me uh, right on your league homepage. So step up to the big leagues this season. Visit cbssports.com slash fbt to get a special offer when you start a new commissioner league today. Again, that's cbssports.com slash FBT. Let's get to some news and notes, Scott. And the big news of the day, unfortunately, was that Tyler Glass now suffered an oblique injury during a live batting practice session and will undergo an MRI on Tuesday to determine the severity. But this does not sound good, Scott. I have Glass now at SP27. You have him at SP30. He returned last year from Tommy John. He only threw like 11 or 12 innings. Uh, and we were, you know, hoping he could stay healthy this year, but it's not looking good so far. Yeah. yeah. Ironically, I'm probably going to be more likely to draft him if this is an injury that puts him on the IL to begin the year because I imagine his, his stock would slip so much that my comfort level with that would improve. You know, that's easier to say in leagues that offer an IL spot. I know not every league does, but I, I do like drafting. Uh, I do like drafting the players whose value is suppressed just by virtue of them not. They won't be on the opening day roster. And I think inning for inning, Tyler Glass now is one of the best pitchers in baseball. But yeah, it could, piling up innings has been a huge problem for him. And oblique injuries are not great, obviously. I mean, I think. Typically, on average, you're looking at four to six weeks, so maybe he misses the first couple of weeks or first month of the season. I'm speculating right now. But at least it's not an arm injury. <laughs> you know, if you want to look yeah. at it glass half full, it's not an arm injury for Tyler Glass. Glass now half full. Ah, professional broadcaster, that's Scott White. White Sox, new manager, pa Pedro Griffal, said they will not have a set closer until Liam Hendricks returns, which, as of now, we have no idea when that's going to be. He said, quote, Absolutely not. That's not how we are going to run it. We've constantly mentioned Kendall Graveman and Ronaldo Lopez, but they also have Aaron Bummer, Joe Kelly, and Jake Diekman in that bullpen, Scott. So this very quickly could turn into one of those big headache situations for saves. Yeah, well, I mean, it's certainly going to start out that way, it sounds like. Now, it doesn't always stay that way. Uh, obviously, there's a certain amount of attrition, a certain amount of... Um, uh, to, like turnover and the relief pitcher spot volatility. That's the word I'm looking for. So not all the pitchers they think they're going to be good going into the season will actually be good. And there's a good chance somebody emerges as a clear favorite for saves there, but it's hard to invest in any one guy in light of this news. I would still say Graveman would be my first choice, but not with a lot of, draft capital dusty baker said sunday that jordan alvarez has yet to start swinging a bat as he battles left hand soreness went on the il with soreness in both of his hands last year just something to monitor i know it's only february still but uh, don't i don't love it gotta say that for jordan alvarez Manny Machado and the Padres finalized an 11-year 350 million dollar extension on sunday so he won't be opting out after all and it's been a wild offseason for the Padres that saw them sign Xander Bogarts and then extended both Machado and Hugh Darvish. All three will be under contract into their 40s. Good luck, Padres. Fernando Tatis Jr. will make his spring debut as the designated hitter on Tuesday. Juan Soto was scratched Monday with left calf tightness right after Scott drafted him, unfortunately. Uh, like they say he might be back in the lineup tomorrow. Sounds like he should be it's all right. fine. Anthony Santander left after being hit by a pitch on his knee. I think he's dealing with a contusion. Should be all right. Rafael Devers, I don't know how true this is, but it was a report. 
Rafael Devers is expected to remain the number two hitter in the Red Sox lineup. He was batting yes. cleanup on Monday. So I think they're trying a few different things out right now, but they did say they want to break up Yoshida and Devers. They don't want them batting back to back two lefties in the lineup. So one way or another, Scott, it's either going to be Yoshida lead, leading off or batting cleanup. But right now it kind of seems like they want Yoshida to bat cleanup. Yeah. yeah. One of the, um, one of the people they tried in the leadoff spot and apparently they don't mind batting other left-handers back to back with Rafael Devers. Cause one of the guys they tried with Tristan Casas, uh, I believe that was Sunday. Yeah. I mean, he's got and big he OBP. Gets, he's got a good yeah, eye. Of play. Yeah. I mean, but, I can't see them actually doing it, but you know, it might be a revolving door. It doesn't Enrique make sense. Hernandez, Alex. Yeah. Verdugo. Yoshida feels like it makes the most sense. You know, it makes a lot right. of contact. He got a good, he had a good eye in Japan. I guess they could put Verdugo there, but I don't know. It doesn't seem to make much sense to me. We'll continue to follow it throughout spring training. Seiya Suzuki underwent medical imaging for his oblique on Sunday. We're waiting to learn more, but another one that's not ideal. Could be looking at missing time early on in the season for Seiya Suzuki. Gavin Lux was carted off the field with a right leg injury on Monday while trying to avoid a thrown ball. He said he heard something pop in his knee, Scott, so this does not sound good either. Yeah. Uh, for Gavin Lux, if he misses extended time, feels like Miguel Rojas will be the beneficiary of that. <laughs> feels like the Dodgers might be making a move of some kind. Yeah. Although you got to like, and I don't mean to be ghoulish about this, but you got to like it for Miguel Vargas's job security. I'm just saying. How dare you? How dare you? We had some surgery revelations this weekend. No idea. I'd never heard of it. Ozzy Albies underwent arthroscopic surgery on his right shoulder last October. Okay. Good to know now. Uh, he'll be limited to just DH for the first week or so of spring training games. Ozzy said it was, quote, just a regular cleanup. Okay. Reese Hoskins underwent arthroscopic knee surgery to deal with, quote, wear and tear. Manager Rob Thompson said Hoskins is a full participant this spring. Okay. I mean, would have been good to know, I guess, but eh, we're, we're finding out now. Some performances to highlight. Again, Scott, I don't want to put too much stock into this, but these prospects came ready to play, man. I mean, some big games over the weekend. Anthony Volpe had two hits, two steals, some big exit velocity numbers when he uh, in a game on Sunday, and then he started at second base on Monday. So showcasing some of that versatility, playing different positions. Brett Beatty went two for two with a walk and a two-run homer on Saturday. Now, all of a sudden, the Mets are talking about playing Eduardo Escobar in left field. So uh, I don't. maybe there's... A legit chance for Brett Beatty to uh, make, make the opening day roster. Jordan Walker went two for four Sunday with a 430-foot home run off of Johnny Cueto. Jared Kelnick, double dong on Sunday. Though mm -hmm. we have seen him have some big spring trainings in the past as well. Uh, Heston Kierstad, a prospect with the Orioles, not seriously in contention for opening day, but he had a double dong on Saturday. He went three for three. Uh, and I know I wrote this down. Reed Detmers and Nathan Avaldi both had some some big games and We'll follow their progress throughout the Garrett, as well. Garrett Mitchell had yeah. a two homer game too, yep, which sure was uh, notable because it was he's like athletic and can hit the ball hard, but he just puts it on the ground so much that it's not clear the in beats in the majors. But if he can figure out how to elevate more consistently, there's a lot of upside for Garrett Mitchell. Uh, you know what, Scott, you really are a professional because that will lead us perfectly into our deep sleeper conversation, which we'll do on the other side of the break here on Fantasy Baseball Today. War has descended upon this place. Mark my words, this fight ain't over. Where I'm going is dangerous. Let's look death in the eye then, shall we? What happened? That's all that's happened. 1923. All episodes now streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. All right, let's talk some deep sleepers to help those who play in deeper mixed leagues, draft and hold leagues, maybe some AL or NL only. And I teased at the top of the show that we have a special guest. Who is it? Every September, our friends from the Fantasy Football Today crew put on their Draft-A-Thon event, a six-hour live stream giving out advice and raising money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Last year, they auctioned off a bunch of fun experiences, and one of them was a guest appearance on this podcast. Please welcome in the winner, 
Elijah Lipkin, who I had the pleasure of meeting on the DFS podcast as well. Smart dude, excited to hear which players he's interested in. Elijah, welcome to the show, my man. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I've been a daily listener for like four years now, whatever Heat's last season was. I think that was 2019. So this is super exciting. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, yeah, and I got to thank my parents uh, for getting me a little birthday present. They made the donation and they gave this as a, as a gift to me. My birthday's in April, so early birthday present. Hey, nice. Awesome. Hey, any way you could get it. So shout out to the parents <laughs> getting it done there. Uh, we appreciate your donation. Obviously, it was it's all for a great cause. And we'll have the draft-a-thon coming up again later this year in September. And I'm sure those guys will be auctioning off some really cool stuff once again. Uh, before we get into these deep sleepers, just uh, let us know a little bit about yourself. Maybe what team you like. How do you feel about peeps? All that fun stuff. <laughs> I am, as you can see by the hat, a Yankee fan. Yeah! Which doesn't yeah, I love the Jeter. I love the the fat heads in the back. I do have this signed Otani jersey. I collect a bunch of memorabilia. And my sales pitch for listening to CBS Sports Fantasy Baseball today, as I told Frank and Scott before the show, this Otani jersey I got with winnings from betting him for MVP before the 2021 season, when Scott especially was gung-ho, all in. This guy's going to play. He's crushing it in spring. It was his MVP pick, so I went and bet it. Made a nice chunk of change, spent it on that. Um, got a bunch of Aaron Judge stuff, a bunch of Yankee stuff. Um, I live in Houston, so it's not easy being a Yankee fan here. But it, uh, I, I get through it. I do get uh, heckled when I walk down the street wearing like a Judge shirt, though. Peeps, I, I'm not. I'm not a big fan. I, I do. They they are a little hated. They're a little too hated. I enjoy a there peep once every every now and then, but I'm not. <laughs> I don't. I don't seek them out. I don't seek them out. That, so is, guess, that is the reasonable opinion. Yeah, okay. I, I guess you're not going to be drinking drinking the Peeps Pepsi, which... Uh, Absolutely not. I sent Scott a picture of on Twitter over the weekend. <laughs> All right, let's get into uh, some of these sleepers. We chose names outside of the top 380 P uh, over at the NFBC in the month of February. So what we're going to do is, Elijah, we'll start with you. Why don't you give us our... Give us your hitters, since Scott so eloquently set you up to talk about Garrett. He did. Uh, give us your hitters. And then we'll go around the horn here. Sure. So the first one, I'll go with Garrett Mitchell and Sal Freelich. I know you guys talk about both. I want the winner of the Brewer center field job, whoever it is. I know Mitch Mitchell's ADP is 307. Freelich's is 552. Big difference. I think that reflects who's more likely to win the job. Um, Scott, you have Mitchell ranked number 92 in your prospects. Freelich number 50. That seems about right to, to kind of show the talent discrepancy between the two. Mitchell debuted last year. He had two homers, eight steals, and only 68 plate appearances. That's pretty great. Um, he's a slap hitter, Scott, which you referred to. So hitting those two home runs in a game, that's huge. He, he has 80-grade speed, like legit, one of the fastest players in baseball. If he, can, with, if he can keep his strikeout rate down, which is weird, the way he hits the ball would make you think that he – the way he makes contact would make you think that he could be a home run hitter, but his swing just drives into the ground. If he can keep his strikeout rate down, it was 26% in the minors last year. In that ballpark, he is going to, I think, be pretty good. He can hit some home runs in that ballpark, even hitting them as line drives. I went back and watched his two home runs from last year. They were line drives. Like, they were kind of doubter home runs, but they were well struck. And in that ballpark, you can do that. I kind of think he might be 10 to 15 homer ceiling, but he could steal 30-plus bases. Where you're getting him, that's pretty nice. Freelick, less to say about him, still a prospect, a good prospect, could be high average, could be high steals. I don't think he wins the job, but I think he comes up at some point more of like a like a deep draft and hold or like a put him on your scout team week one, because as soon as he get called gets called up, that's the guy you want, because he could be a 300 hitter in his rookie year, if all goes well. He, that's the kind of skill set he has. I like, I love the, the Stephen Kwan comparisons are great. And Scott, I think there's a chance with Garrett Mitchell and Sal Freelich that they could both have value at the same time. Because right now, I mean, Tyrone Taylor is penciled in as the starting right fielder, according to roster resource. So we could have Garrett Mitchell in center. We could have Sal Freelich in right field. I don't know that it will happen right away on opening day, but it wouldn't surprise yeah. me if it happened shortly into the season as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a very likely scenario, and it would give uh, the Brewers a athletic outfield uh, they'll be running lots of fly balls, an attractive situation. 
I think the comparison between Free Lick and Chill is more yeah. about lore than anything else. Like Sal Free Lick seems like a can't miss version of what he's gonna is that especially high sling. <laughs> it's, it's Stephen Kwan like, which is you know obviously good, but it's not you know Sal Free Lick's never gonna be an early round type pick in fantasy. Garrett Mitchell, I mean. If he can figure out if he if he can adjust his his launch angle, which he never got around to doing in the minors, so that doesn't give me a lot of confidence he will, then he could be huge. It's a very low probability scenario, and I, unlike Freelick, there's a chance with Mitchell, you know, all the ground balls, all the strikeouts that he just n never really pans out. So, if if that scenario of them both in the same outfield comes to be it's it's probably good news for mitchell because he hasn't he hasn't fallen flat on his face yet elijah give us the other two deep hitter sleepers that you have on this list uh one of them is eduardo escobar who you guys brought up briefly this one is a lot more narrative but there was a report i don't know if you guys talked about it last week that he was dealing with a family matter all year and it didn't get solved till august like a personal family matter sounded pretty serious and then September and October, lo and behold, he has a 981 OPS. He was great. Um, he ended up, his end of season numbers didn't look too bad. 20 homers, 240 average, 69 RBI, which you're, you're getting him at 393 overall. That's that's fine if you get him there as a bench piece. Um, I think he can end up hitting as high as sixth in the Mets lineup, kind of 789 or 6789 are all not great hitters. Pennsylvan right now, he could get up to sixth. Good RBI spot, especially with, uh, Jeff McNeil projected to hit in front of him. Um, and his if you look at the percentiles of his, a bunch of his stat cast numbers, his XBA, X slug, barrel rate, max EV, hard hit rate, walk rate, all of them in 2022 are virtually the same or even better than 2021. So the raw numbers, like the raw numbers of those were worse, but the percentiles were the same in the, with the change in environment. It would make, lead you to believe that he could be a similar place among third basemen as he was in 2021. If he just has more luck, maybe he's more focused. 2021, he was the number 12 third baseman, according to Rasball Player Raider. So if he just kind of locks in and he's not dealing with something all year, I think he could bounce back. And to talk about him playing left field, that would add to his positional versatility. That would be nice. And I don't think Mark Canna is very good, so I'm not that worried about – like I'm not – I'm more worried about Canna with Brett Beatty coming up than I would be about Escobar losing playing time. Mm -hmm. Last year, the Mets were fifth in runs scored, and we saw a crazy run in RBI totals for Pete Alonso and Francisco Lindor. So if Escobar could just stay healthy and keep, you know, stay focused, as you mentioned, Elijah, and uh, carry over anything that we saw from September, he could potentially help out with the counting stats as well. Give us this last hitter because, I mean... This is a this is a deep league specialty. I mean, we're talking yep. AL only leagues right here. I have never seen this player before. <laughs> you, Frank, you mentioned him very briefly because you were reading roster resource the other day on the mailbag. I think it was Nate Eaton is his name. He uh, so he's on the Royals outfielder. His ADP is six eighty five. He's the six hundred second player off the board. I don't know which ADP is better, but. Drew Waters, who's a well-regarded prospect for the Royals, he got hurt. He's an outfielder. He's going to miss the start of the season, probably the first couple of weeks, if not more, if there's a setback. Um, Nate Eaton is an outfielder and third baseman. He played a little bit last year, towards the end of the year. He ended up uh, with 122 plate appearances. He stole 11 bases and was only caught one, so 11 for 12 on steals. In the minors last year, he stole 23, 23 of 28, between double A AA and triple A. He had 97 percentile sprint speed and 100 percentile arm strength for what that's worth. Um, and he also plays third base. So the opportunity is there. He's going to probably be a starter to begin the year with Waters' injury. But even when Waters comes back, Hunter Dozier is the third baseman for the Royals right now. I don't think anyone thinks Hunter Dozier is good anymore. So there's a spot for Eaton at third base if he's playing well enough to retain a spot. And the Royals are not good. They should want to play these young guys. He does not hit the ball hard. That's the issue. And that's why he's going 685 overall. But he had a 215 ISO and a 134 WRC plus in 229 plate appearances last year in AAA. So there could be something there. It's a small sample, but there might be something in there. Um, why I prefer him to Tyler Gentry, who you guys love, and I agree, 
nice prospect, Tyler Gentry. Tyler Gentry's not on the 40-man roster. Nate Eaton obviously is. So Eaton's going to get the first shot, and he might get all the shots this year. Gentry may not be, with the way the service time manipulation works and the rookie of the year stuff works, he may not be called up till the end of the year. So I'm in on Eaton. I have him. I did two 15-team 50-round draft and holds, so 750 players taken. I've got him in both so far. I think he could be a not hurtful average, 30 steals, 5 to 10 home runs, pick 600-something. That's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the speed is his calling card. You mentioned it, 23 steals in the minors last year. His 18 or more steals each season in the minor leagues. That is Nate Eaton, who's pretty much been a utility player. He could play third base. He could play in the outfield. Roster Resource has him at right field right now. And has an opportunity with uh, Drew Waters going down with injury. Scott, let's slide over to you here and uh, give me some of your uh, – just you can rattle off all of them. All your deep sleeper hitters that you've got on this list since uh, – you got a lot of them, five of them on here. Yeah, and I was trying to come up with some different names than the, the guys we talked about on the position previews. Uh, so these aren't necessarily my favorite, but I got tons of deep sleepers. When I write this article in a couple of weeks, it's going to be like 30 names deep or something. So uh, so one is Oscar Colas, I guess, who I have talked about a decent amount, um, but we've seen him play a little this spring and uh, you know had huge numbers in the minors last year. The White Sox have led the, left the right right field job wide open for him um he's had a couple singles hit hard the other way and he says that's something he's focused on doing like he wants to be a more complete hitter than as opposed to just a power hitter which you know he hit over 300 in the minors last year i think that's encouraging uh it, power to the pull side translates a lot better these days than it did during like opposite field home runs are going to be scarcer moving forward but I think Oscar Colas hits the ball hard enough that, you know, it's it's still nice to see him going the other way. Oswald Peraza is the favorite to win the Yankees shortstop job. Beat writers are on record saying so. We had doubts based on the way Aaron Boone handled him when he got called up late last year, whether he'd go away from Isaiah Kiner Falefa for Peraza. And it's still not to be determined, I guess. But it's looking much more likely then maybe ADP would suggest considering he's being drafted outside the top 300. And this is a power speed threat at shortstop. So he is one of those very few interesting players you can draft after that, uh, that big drop off that happens in the mid to late rounds at that position. Uh, I, I find myself drafting Peraza more and more Jared Kelnick. You talked about the two Homer game he had over the weekend. And I, I think it's kind of ridiculous, first of all, that we're this far out on Kelnick so far. I know he has basically a full season's worth of stats now where he's hit like 160. So on the one hand, I kind of understand it. On the other hand, he's still 23 years old and put up huge numbers at AAA when he was there last year. I, I don't know. I just think we're – I think this is uh, – I think we've been scared off a little too much from Kelnick, the royal we. That is, I'd be happy to take him at his going rate. And those two home runs he hit. So this is a fun stat. Um, one was 113 miles per hour. One was 107 miles per hour. He had a second batted ball in that game that was 107 miles per hour. Now, this is according to TrackMan because they don't have stat cast set up there. So I'm kind of mixing sources here with this stat. Um, and this is actually coming from MLB.com. But... Three balls hit 107 miles per hour or harder in the same game for Jared Kelnick. Coming straight from MLB.com here. For context, only Aaron Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Jock Peterson, and O'Neal Cruz had more than three batted balls at 107 miles per hour or harder in a single se single regular season game last year. And in Mariners history, only Nelson Cruz has done that, and he did it one time. And that's what Jared Kelnick did in that spring game. So, like... It's got to be able to hit breaking balls. I understand, but like there's still a lot of talent there that we shouldn't be sleeping on. Uh, Jake Fraley of the Reds is another one of my deep sleepers here. And remember, we liked him going into last year. He was moving from Seattle to Cincinnati. And if you looked at all the underlying numbers, it would suggest Seattle was really suppressing his power and he was going to the most Homer friendly park. Uh, Took a while for him to come around. He spent some time on the IL. But when he came back in late July, 
through the end of the season. Jake Fraley hit 295 with a 377 on base percentage and 903 OPS, 11 homers in 53 games. He only stole three bases, but he's been more of a base dealer than that in the past. He's already stolen a base this spring. Uh, and there's less competition for playing time in the Reds outfield than there was even last year. So I think Jake Fraley is going to play a lot. I think he's a sneaky 2020 threat, potentially with a high OBP. Might sit some against left-handers, but... Um, I, I think he's a pretty attractive pick. And then Bryce Tarang, I think is how you say it. Uh, Brewers shortstop prospect who's in contention for the second base job. And it sounds like he's a pretty strong contender. They did sign, they could go with Brian Anderson at third and Luis Arias at second, or they could shift Arias over to third and start Tarang at second. Tarang stole more than 30 bases in the minors last year. I think he had 13 home runs, good on base skills. Uh, Eligible right now at shortstop, so he's another potential deep fallback option there. He's going to pick up second base eligibility if if this comes to pass and he wins the job for the Brewers, so that would help at that position too. Yeah, the numbers for Bryce Tarang, Scott, you mentioned some of them, 13 home runs, 34 steals, 286 batting average, all of that being done at AAA last season. He was someone I was more excited about earlier in the offseason before they signed Brian Anderson, but... I, who knows? I, I probably should not be worried about Brian Anderson at this point in his career. The only thing I will caution with Jared Kelnick, Scott, is he has had good numbers in his spring training career. Like 253 batting average, eight homers, and 890 OPS in all of his career spring training games. But I want right. to focus on more than anything, the strikeouts. Can he make contact during spring training? That's what matters to me more than anything else. Yeah, but that like the the exit velocity, like the fact that so few players have done that in a major league game, you know that that goes beyond just stats to me. That that that's like a a clear reflection of raw talent that we shouldn't lose sight of with Kelnick. So that's even more so than the two home runs. I thought that was notable from that performance. The three hitters for me, no surprise, they come from the National League because I'll be competing in uh, NL only labor this weekend. So uh, maybe. Uh... Might have been studying a little bit. Spencer Steer uh, with an ADP of 467. He came over to the Reds in the Tyler Malley trade last year. Good numbers in the minors. He had 274 with 23 home runs. Likely to start at third base, though he does have to improve defensively. I saw he made some blunders this weekend uh, playing the position. Uh, the thing is, the Reds don't really have much else. So I think they're going to give Spencer Steer an opportunity early on in the season. And if he takes off, then there you go. You have someone going outside of the top 450 in ADP right now. David Villar is the next one here. He's going at pick 541. He had 36 home runs last season between the minors and the majors. He had a really strong September where he hit 269 with eight home runs, an 897 OPS, and an 11% barrel rate. And all the recent reports that I've seen have the Giants' uh, third base job as David Villar's to lose. They still have J.D. Davis on the team. Uh, they have Lamont Wade, who I think those guys are kind of battling it out for first base. Sounds like the Giants want David VR to play third, and he's got really, really big pop going super late in drafts. The last name here, and this one's this one's way down the list. Will Benson recently traded from the Guardians to the Reds, former first round pick back in 2016. He had a really good season in the minors last year. He hit 278 with a 426 on base percentage, 17 home runs, 16 steals, 948 OPS, got his strikeouts down. It's he struggled to make contact in his career. 22.7% in the minors last year. So he did you know, make some adjustments, and he improved last season. And I, I don't know that Nick Senzel is going to be ready to start the season. He's coming back from off-season toe surgery. So if he's not ready, Will Benson performs well in spring training. I, I think he had either a steal or two when I was watching earlier today. Um, then, yeah, I think he's going to get an opportunity to play. It's a really good ballpark, and he's he's got some skills, so. He did. He did from come from the Guardians, though, not the Nationals. Just what to, I, I did. I say Nationals. Yeah, you did. Uh, well, I wrote down Guardians. I don't know why I said. I'm Nationals. sure. I'm sure Guardians <laughs> fans were getting angry at you for that. So yeah, there you go, uh, Elijah. Yeah. We just threw a bunch of names out there. Is there one name that Scott and I mentioned that you might be interested in as well? Terang. I'll name two because they were the first two off that I didn't put. Were Terang and VR. When I'm looking at sleepers like that late in the draft, I want guys who I think can be like elite at a category. And so I think VR is one of the last guys who could give you, in like a best case scenario, 20, 25 home runs. And Turang's one of the last guys who can really help you in average 
probably not average as much as steals. They could really help you in steals. So both of those, very interesting. All right. Well, got a couple of minutes here. We're going to go a little bit long here and, you know, let Elijah have a little fun here on the podcast. Let's uh, let's talk about some of these pitchers, Elijah. So you can run through all three of them. Um, right cool. Right now. I'll go through quickly. Um, first one, I'll have two relievers and one starter. So we'll go Adbert Alzali is the first one. He's an old friend, an old uh, an old sleeper call. Um, I bought in hard when you guys were all in on him. Didn't work out, but I think this is the year. He's he's a reliever now. No starter, no messing around with that. He's a reliever. Um, injured a lot last year, but he did end up with 13 and two thirds innings, which not a big sample size, but that's like 20% of what a reliever season is. So like, it's not, it's not nothing. Um, he had a three, three, eight ERA, but a 0.83 whip, 19 strikeouts and two walks. So those are really good numbers. Um, his advanced numbers last year, again, not a great sample size, but 222 X ERA, 179 X BA and 295 X slug. 2021, which was a bad year for him, what crushed him was home runs. It's not an issue anymore, really, with the dejuiced ball, the whole new environment, not as much of an issue. His launch angle from 2021 to 2022 was around, um, sorry, 2020 and 2021 was around 10%. Last year was 16%. And I think, again, new environment, that works. If you give up more fly balls as opposed to line drives, that works. Those aren't necessarily like, towering fly balls, but they're better than giving up line drives, which he had a problem with in the past. His whiff percentage was really high last year. And now he's, he used to be like a five pitch pitcher. Now he can kind of whittle that down to like two to three. Um, and then he's in the bullpen. Cubs bullpen has no one proven. It's, it's, pretty, it's as wide open as it gets. The Cubs defense is great. So I'm kind of in on Cubs pitchers in general this year. They put a real focus on getting an elite defense. So I think you should buy into your favorite Cubs reliever late in drafts. Hope you get a good safe source, and this one's mine. I will jump to my next reliever, Daniel Hudson, uh, on the Dodgers, ADP 343. 24 innings last year because I think he tore his ACL. Some kind of – it wasn't an arm injury, I don't believe. Um, he had a, he was great. 2.22 ERA, 0.9 whip, 11K per nine, five saves. Those five saves, despite not pitching after June 24th, those five saves were the second most on the Dodgers. Um, I want to look, I, I like to look at sometimes vacated saves, kind of like vacated targets in fantasy football, like what teams lost the most saves. The Dodgers are second only to the White Sox in terms of like saves that they've lost from last year. So lots of opportunity. He was clearly the number two guy last year, again, even though he only pitched like half the season. So there's no reason to believe that with his age, his track record, I don't think there's any reason to believe that he wouldn't be the guy that gets the first look. Um, fun stat I found on him, his K minus walk rate, which is a good stat to kind of determine pitcher skill, 25.8% last year was better than Class A, Felix Bautista, Kenley Jansen. Not that he's better than them, obviously, but just showing you the kind of talent that he has. So I think if he can be that talented, you get a guy who's going to close for a team that good, that's worth it at way late in the draft, past 300. And then I'll go to my last one, starting pitcher, Jose Suarez for the Angels. His ADP is 417. Last year, he was not bad. He had eight wins, a 396 ERA, eight and a half K per nine. He was only 24 years old last year, so he's 25 this year. He's young. He came with decent prospect pedigree, not a top 100 guy, but a guy that was expected to kind of be in a major league rotation. He had a 367 X ERA. So right there, he was a little unlucky. He actually rose his K rate as well as K per nine was 7.8 in 2021, up to eight and a half in 2022, in a year where strikeouts went down across the league. So that's gotta indicate some sort of skills gain. And he was demoted earlier in the year, actually. April 30th, he was sent down with a 6.35 ERA after his first few starts. He returned on June 7th, made 17 appearances. He went, he had a 3.55 ERA, all eight of his wins came in that time, and a 1.13 whip, and he maintained he had that same eight and a half K per nine. And he went pretty deep into games. Scott, I know you appreciate that. And I, I, I found it strange that a guy that goes this deep into games would be available, like pick 400, this deep without kind of killing your ERA and getting you some strikeouts. Five of those 17 appearances after he came back from the minors were six plus innings. And three of those five came in his last six starts. So towards the end of the year, when they had let him loose, he was going 90 plus pitches a start and he was doing it pretty efficiently because he was, he never hit 100 but he was getting through six or even seven innings. 
he's not the kind of guy I don't think that makes like this big year over year jump in terms of talent. But all he has to do is get a little bit better, kind of maintain what he did after he came back from the minors. And he's like a fantastic value at this pick. And he's locked into the rotation as well. He's not so he's the fifth or fourth or fifth guy. He's not competing for that sixth spot. So he's in. I think he can be pretty good. Yeah, that is Hayes, uh, Jose Suarez that we were just talking about here. And yeah, I think he is a true sleeper. Like there is no reason why he shouldn't be going higher. I mean, I think people are just kind of forgetting about him and maybe they don't realize he's in the Angels rotation, but he was good. As you mentioned last year, sneaky 11.7% swinging strike rate. And he changed his pitch mix. He threw a new slider 20% of the time last year. So that could explain the increase in K per nine and obviously the swinging strike rate um, last year. And for the other two, I mean, Daniel Hudson, great stats there. I mean, obviously we'll see what happens with the Dodgers. We spoke about Evan Phillips on yesterday's podcast. Uh, and then Adbert Azalai, 18 career games as a reliever, 2.32 ERA, 0.96 whip, 11.6 K per nine. Scotty, I know you rattled yep. off a bunch of deep sleepers uh, last week when we were doing our starting pitcher previews, but yep, part got three. One name here, one lonely name. Yeah. Well, before I get to that name, I just want to point out that Martin Perez qualifies for that exer this exercise, drafted outside the top 300 on average, which is pretty ridiculous considering he was a must roster player all season long. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to point that out, Martin Perez. All right, Ian Anderson is the name I'm actually going to talk about here who, uh, because I think he probably has the inside track on the fifth starter job. Mike Soroka's coming back from that twice-ruptured Achilles tendon, but he's been slowed by a hamstring issue. It's not clear he's going to be built up in time, even if he pitches well enough to win the job. I, I imagine they'll play it safe and have him begin the year in the minors. Meanwhile, Bryce Elder got uh, knocked around in his first spring start. Doesn't have the same upside anyway. I mean, Anderson, upside-wise, you know, this was a pitcher we were... A lot of people were drafting him in the same range as, like... I, I don't know. He was he was kind of mentioned with Shane McClanahan and Alec Manoa as one of these upside -y, Maybe he could take a next step and become a true fantasy standout. Obviously, those guys did, and Ian Anderson took a big step back. But that's that's how he was regarded as recently as a year ago. And uh, he spent this offseason working on his mechanics, had a biomechanical evaluation. Um, it's worked on a slider to go with that changeup. That's so He's got that fastball changeup combination that's so good. And he has kind of a show-me curveball, but he's been working on a slider. We haven't seen him pitch yet this spring. I'm anxious to see the results and how much he actually uses that slider. But I could see Ian Anderson restoring his value pretty quickly. And if you can get in now, could be a big payoff for you. What'd you, what'd you say, Scotty? They, they basically turned him into a robot. And, and now he's got <laughs> All right. I want to find the exact biomechanical. Uh, I don't know what you <laughs> biometric evaluation. Oh, oh, all right. Okay. So I don't think it was a driveline baseball thing, but it sounds very sophisticated. Doesn't it? They took his fingerprints, you know? Yeah. I mean, he is. Uh, he is a post type sleeper. I mean, obviously he's performed in the past. He's he's got the secondaries. He throws hard, but he's got to be able to throw strikes. So we'll see if he could do that in the spring. That is Ian Anderson. I'll quickly run through my three names here. I've got Mackenzie Gore at 380 last year. He was awesome through his first eight starts. And I know it's only been one spring start so far, but the fastball velocity was up once again. It was around 95 miles per hour. That's what we need to see. There's a lot of volatility with Mackenzie Gore when it comes to his velocity and his control. But if he can you know, keep keep the velo up and, and keep the, the walks to around three per nine, then I do think there is some upside there for Mackenzie Gore. I mentioned Shintaro Fujinami last week. I, I do like him. I, I kind of like these misfit pitchers on the Oakland A's and they're trying to find a way to make the rotation. Kyle Muller is more than a misfit, obviously. I mean, he comes with prospect pedigree. His ADP is 561. Came over to the A's in the Sean Murphy trade this offseason. Had some good numbers in the minors last year. Well over a strikeout per inning. And I was reading a story about how he featured a new power slider with more horizontal break in his first spring start. And he picked up four whiffs with that yeah. slider. So uh, I think there's a lot to like there. Obviously, very big ballpark to pitch in there out in Oakland. 
Control, another one. He's got to keep the walks down, but uh, there's obviously big strikeout potential with Kyle Muller. And the last name here, another reliever. I brought up his name a few times. I think I mentioned him yesterday too, but Matt Moore, he's going at an ADP of 697. I think he's going to start to rise now that he has a job with the uh, LA Angels. We don't know exactly what that job is going to be. He reinvented himself last year as a reliever with the Rangers, and he had an awesome season. Another one with way too many walks, but uh, 10K per nine. Five saves, 14 holds, a 14.7% swinging strike rate for Matt Moore. And he threw his curveball a career high 38% of the time. The Angels' bullpen is wide open. It's up for grabs. They have other lefties they could use in left-on-left in left left situations. So if Matt Moore is awesome in spring training, I think there's a chance that he could earn some saves with the Los Angeles Angels. Uh, all right, that, that's going to do it here. I mean, Elijah, any of the, these pitchers we mentioned that you wanted to highlight? I'll say one thing about Fujinami. He was one of the guys I considered too. I heard some stuff about him. He apparently, his fastball is like not great and he struggles with command. Uh, some people think that the the American style of pitching where like you can kind of quote unquote pitch backwards and leave with your breaking stuff could really help him. So, and he's he was promised a spot in the rotation. So I think that's a guy I want because at least for the first couple starts, you'll want to use him, you know, outdoor stadium, great place to pitch. I think he could be a good good guy, at least for the first few weeks. Then you kind of see what you have. All right. That is Shintaro Fujinami. And that is Elijah Lipkin. We appreciate you coming on, bud. We appreciate your donation once again to the Draft-a-thon and uh, obviously all of that going to St. Jude's Hospital. So we appreciate you, man. Go Yankees and have a good season, man. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It's been, uh, it's been a dream come true being on here. I've been a listener for a long time, so really appreciate it. Thank you guys yeah. for having me. Yeah, go go eat some peeps and, and then get a biometric <laughs> evaluation and, and we'll see what happens there. For Scott and Elijah, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.